Adapt 2030 Mini Ice Age Conversations covers changes in our climate due to a new and intensifying grand solar minimum. In the media, overlooking, downplaying, or burying cold weather changes occurring on our planet. This is in order to keep the global warming agenda steaming full speed ahead. I do this podcast and radio program because we need to begin conversations on how to adapt our food growing strategies long before 2030 as agricultural zones shift, affecting global crop output, but very few mainstream media outlets are talking about the most important issue of our time, cold weather crop losses. Our sun is going through a 400 year cycle, which has effects on our weather patterns as our magnetosphere weakens and the jet streams go out of flow. It's not CO2, it's not you, it's the sun. Are you ready to thrive in the grand solar minimum? Then join me for many Ice Age Conversations. I'm your host, David Dubine. Now I've been pulling up a, a bunch of different articles here. If anybody's out there on the net, I would like to take you to, to iceagenow.info. And we're going to come right up to the Greenland Ice Project Survey. That's the GISP2, a data set. The third entry down there, you're going to find this amazing chart of the declining Holocene temperatures off the Greenland ice cores that the IPCC loves and references as fact, as well as everybody else. It's the most detailed recombination of Earth's temperatures. And everybody believes and everybody agrees is the gold standard. It was much warmer in the past than it is today. Take a look at 5,000 years ago. Take a look at 1,000 years ago. These temperatures were warmer than today. I don't care if you believe in CO2 warming. That is your own opinion, how the climate drives. It's still up in the debate science. That's why the grand solar minimum is still in debate. That's why CO2 is still in debate. It's science. We need to debate it. The fact was they've already cataloged the temperatures. Do we already know what the temperatures were back 8,000 years ago? 10,000 years ago, we know what the temperatures were and absolutely unequivocally 100% far warmer in the past. Understood that there's fires, but I'm going to say the media is so quick to jump on. Oh, it's a fire season. It's a big fire. Okay, great. In the last 10 years, I'll agree. Actually, the last 12, it's been big fires in these last 12 years. But when you start to go back to global fires and fires across our planet, back to the 1700s, we were at a very low state. Again, there's some great information on the amount of total fires dating back to the 1700s. But somehow this is too inconvenient to look at that we're actually at a really low point of fires. Because you got to think about how many neighborhoods there are, how many roads there are, how many cities, how much forest there is not now that cannot burn because there's no longer a forest there. So the amount of acres burned in the 1700s was exponentially larger than it is today, even back in the 1800s. But somehow this is so quickly overlooked by you. A quick, any search on a search engine, look up historical burned acreage, 1700s, 1800s, and you'll come up with these charts. Go into the images and then look and see what you find. I, I wish you all the safety in the world, firefighters out there. I applaud what you're doing. Thank you so much for saving lives and homes and property and evacuating people. That is such a service for our country and for our states and for us as people, helping people. It shows the humanity is back in our species again. Risking life and limb to help others and save others. That is a huge statement and also a gift from one sentient being to another. And I do applaud you for your service. Thanks for risking your lives out there for the rest of us. But when the news media does not even fact check this, such a simple fact. Any search engine on the planet. Just put in a GISP2. Holocene. H-O-L-O-C-E-N-E. Millennia or century. Temperature reconstruction. And you will find dozens and dozens of the same charts I'm talking about. So it really begs the question now, 
Who's pushing which agenda here? It seems like the collusion is really the media with the lying politicians to push false narrative, to continue to keep you unprepared, to keep you believing that it's CO2, to try to institute a global tax still. And they're going to continue to try this global tax. And they're going to continue to keep saying, oh, it's global warming, global warming. And as I've been saying with the news media battle that's going on, and it truly is, it's a battle for the narrative at the moment to explain to you why all these crazy things are happening. Now, the analysis, and I, let's go into a little forecasting here. What you have seen up to this point is just the beginning. Now, the charts that are based on magnetic canceling waves on the sun, now you can Google this one here, it's just magnetic canceling waves, and the authors of the paper, which they've done several, and follow-ups and follow-ups, and then others joining in on their research, etc., all peer-reviewed, the authors of the paper are Zarkova, that's Z-H-A-R-K-O-V-A, -Z Zarkov, Z-H-A-R-K-O-V, Shepard, S-H-E-P-A-R-D, and Potpov, P-O-T-P-O-V. And it's called the double dynamo in the sun, double dynamo in the sun. Now, in one of the graphics, you'll find, go, hit a search engine, any one, and this should pop up. You'll find a colored version of what the black and white version was, where it turns from sort of greenish into yellow, and there's two big humps and two big waves in the middle of that chart. Now, what the waves indicate, the wider the waves are, indicate that the canceling effect of the magnetic fields and magnetic Oh, sections on the sun, if you will. I'm going to keep it incredibly simple here. The layers of the sun and the magnetism are going to cancel each other out. And when this happens, the sun goes into a lower activity state. There'll be less sunspots. There'll be less solar flares. Unless it's an EMP where the sun is trying to equalize its charge and it's too charged and it lets off a huge gigantic flare to let the, uh, the rest of that plasma electrical state come to equilibrium. Other than that, what you consider little sunspots and, you know, M-class solar flare, that's all going to cease right now. And if you take a look at the sun, there hasn't been a sunspots up there for weeks. So that chart I'm talking about, the wave really, really, really starts to widen right now. It even shows you on the chart, it's smack right in the middle of 2018. When, now you got to think about this. Let's go back in time, back to, let's say, 2017 in the beginning in uh, January. Incredible cold temperatures, record cold everywhere, huge snows, all-time record snow in Boston, all-time record snow in France, Italy, all-time record snow in China, so many other places there was all-time record snows. But it's snow in Vietnam that year as well. So all kind of different places where there was record snow, India, and cold, massive losses of fruit, the beginning of 2017 until now. So that last one and a half years of changing climate that we've all witnessed, record floods, record heat, record droughts, record cold, record snow, atmospheric compression events, once in a thousand year flood coming every other week. Okay, that's all these last year and a half as one unit of change, one unit. As we move forward into the rest of 2019, all of that change is going to be squished into these next six months as another uptick. And all of that is going to equal the next uptick in amount of change that we're going to experience in this next six months. And then, then it gets interesting because the amount of uptick after that point from 2019 to 20 is four times more intense than all the weather changes we've seen in the last year and a half, combined in a one-year period, times four. But see, then it gets better because the end of 2019, we're not even near the top yet. Then 2020, it goes six times more. Intensity on the change. So if we're already at the tip point and we're hella way up in there into, let's even say quadruple, four times more intense weather than the last year and a half combined, and it gets four times more intense through 2019. 
and it's already at that apex state and it's already incredible climate chaos. 2020 is going to be six times more intense than 2019. And so this is why I'm doing my channel. You know, I, I don't, I used to be a coffee buyer and this is the reason I do my channel because we saw the cold weather losses in Burma and Myanmar. And I started to get different information from John Casey. And then, you know, I got directed to these reports here from Zarkova, Popov Shepard, and Dr. Apuzamatov over at the uh, Pukovo Observatory. And everything's pointing to a cooling trend coming. But the amount of weather chaos, your lives are about to change. I'm saying, stating on the record again here, I will state right this second, we are at the last year of stable food growing on this planet. From this point forward, our seasons will be unstable enough where it will affect crop production. It already is. Look at the droughts in Australia. Look at the droughts happening across the world, the freezes that decimated the wheat crop in America earlier this year. And once we get around 2020 at the end, where we're going to come into 2021, it's still going to uptick another two times. And then it's going to level. Now, this is wave number one. There's two waves coming. After it peaks on that wave and those magnetic canceling, the, what the sun is going to do, the out of phase is going to start to sync up again and the magnetic field will restart, if you will. And just as quickly as we were at that incredible apex of weather change, now the magnetic fields on the sun are going to try to, you know, come back out and not cancel as much. And they're going to, the weather's going to do something incredibly different as these waves try to recompress in three years. And this will bring us up to 2023 and 2024. And at that point in 2024, going in, and again, this will be like January, February, March, somewhere in the beginning of the year of 2024, the magnetic waves cancel again, and we go through an entirely new wave of what we're about to experience over these next two and a half years of, not actually three years, because it'll go through the first half of 2021, pretty much to about today, but you know, in 2021 will be the apex of that wave, and then it'll... Who knows what's going to happen on the backside as the magnetic waves on the sun start to come out of phase and they go into phase again and they start, you know, there'll be more solar activity. Our magnetosphere will behave a little differently. It might recompress and then all the real loose jet streams are going to have to go somewhere. That means massive wind movements and starting to see the same exact stuff we're seeing now because it's just going to be the opposite. So what's happening currently is the sun is going into its canceling wave phase where everything is becoming very low activity on the sun. So our earth matches what's happening electromagnetically on the sun. So these waves will cancel. So our earth should also be showing signs of the magnetosphere weakening. And if they do, the jet streams are going out of flow. Fine. They're not locked in pattern anymore. This is why we're seeing this incredible heat. It's the equatorial vortex. Media missing the whole thing on jet streams. They're focused on CO2. But they're focused on jet streams when it's cold to explain it, but they don't focus on jet streams coming off the equator, bent in the wrong direction and ex bending and pushing extremely far north to explain all the record heat that we're seeing in pockets. You know, here's the thing. It's pockets and it's very narrow band of pockets like we see with the polar vortex. It'll push straight down, but it'll be a thousand miles wide, but it'll freeze solid everything in that thousand miles pincer, if you will. Now we have the same thing happening going north. So the jet streams come off the equator there, boom, they skyrocket straight north, but it's only in that little thousand mile band that they're getting extreme heat or even a little bit below as these heat fronts pass. Same with the cold fronts. After they pass, it warmed a little bit after each one of those during the uh, polar vortex. So we have these two vortexes, the equatorial vortex and the polar vortex. How do you think they're able to move? They're able to move because our jet streams are going haywire because our magnetosphere is no longer tight enough to keep them locked in place. So I'm really curious what's going to happen next year and the year after next when there's really going to be no magnetosphere to speak of to compress these jet streams or our atmosphere in on itself as it's done with a tight magnetosphere. And also the galactic cosmic rays are going to be pouring in at rates unseen in multi-centuries. And I was talking to Peter Temple not too long ago, worldcyclesinstitute.com. He talks about civilization cycles, economic cycles, cycles of society and rulership, you know, governance, if you will, cycles of government. 
cycles of migration, cycles of food production. These are all cyclical. So when we look back in the 1600s, we see what happened then. So if our magnetosphere is getting weak and it hasn't been like that since you know, 400 years ago, we need to really look and take a discerned look into what's happening and some of the causation of these heat and cold events. Now, the media is in super overdrive to try to explain every cold event because it's global warming and it's CO2 making more cold and more snow. This for a kindergartner should just put up a red flag already. Garden child, tell a kindergarten child to go touch something hot and then turn it into ice. Go tell a kindergarten child to open a hot oven and see if it snows in their house. A kindergartner would laugh at that because they haven't been trained to stick into the status quo and don't question things and don't rock the boat and don't talk about it at work because you get fired. Kindergartners would laugh in your face if you told them the hot creates the record snow and ice. Other mechanisms such as pulse water into the Arctic that's cooler from the Atlantic cooling. That's why there's more ice up there. Italian forecasters also calling for snowier, longer winters. Now, see, this is a funny thing, though. It's not even meteorologists. It's geologists. Mirko Poletto, thumbs up. Thank you very much for stating on the record there. How these cycles are in time, and we have geologists telling us cold cycles are coming back, but the, the climatologists are saying, no, it's CO2. Except the breakaway crew that's already saying, whoa, dude, we've been saying this for years. It's going to get cold. You guys are still over on the CO2 bandwagon. These people that are still pushing CO2, we should make a full list of them because when it starts to cool, they should be questioned as to pushing the narrative and and have to explain themselves why with all this new scientific data over these last five to seven years showing us going into a cooling trend that they were still pushing the warming agenda in the papers and pushing the warming agenda, et cetera, and still denouncing people who are talking about, I don't know, sunspot cycles driving the climate. We should start to make a full database and then hold these people accountable when the time comes when your crops are lost, your food prices are doubling and tripling, your grids are going down and people are freezing to death in their homes, and we had no time to prepare because the media was all in on this collusion to get you to continue to think global warming. 